Hello and welcome. This presentation has been developed for iAssist 2021, the Global Virtual Conference, and originally scheduled for May 20th, 2021. This presentation is titled From Pilot to Jetstream, Building Training Pathways and Collaboration in Data Science and Digital Humanities through the Library. It describes the Graduate Specialist Program at Rutgers University, the New Brunswick Libraries, and I'm Brian Womack, Data Librarian at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Um, I want to acknowledge the work and support of Dee Magnoni, our Associate University Librarian for Rutgers, New Brunswick, uh, who contributed a, a couple of the slides here and uh, more importantly has supported this program from its inception. Now, I did a version of this talk that I digressed, I illustrated things by clicking around online, and it ended up at 56 minutes. So I realized I needed to provide you guys with a concise version. So in this version, I'm going to blast through the slides. I'm barely going to digress by going to the web. And if you want more detail, go check out the longer uh, version, which I'll provide a link to. So here's an outline of what we're going to talk about. And I'm going to just start stepping through that to keep things moving. Uh, background to this, we're talking about a project that started in spring 2018. But for many years, I have been working with data, delivering data workshops, got involved with R starting in 2010. Uh, and along the way, have seen a consistent demand. People are always asking you for more, more different topics, and Python in particular, which has not been my stronger side. I'm more of an R person. Uh, we also have at Rutgers an uh, active digital humanities, libra digital humanities program that has flourished under our digital humanities librarian, Francesca Gianetti, who's been at Rutgers since 2014. Another piece of the puzzle was in 2015-2016, um, I did some work with um, Professors Deboer Silver and Manish Parashar at Rutgers on a grant proposal uh, for learning pathways to data science, um, where, where we recognize for a long time that students are thrown into courses where <clears throat> they're expected to use these tools like Python and R, but they're given very little formal instruction in them, uh, told to pick it up on their own. and we saw the library as a neutral and friendly third place that could provide this kind of support for students. So a lot of the thinking that went into those grants, uh, those proposals which were ultimately unsuccessful, uh, did influence what we actually did quite a bit. So <clears throat> the next couple of slides are the director's perspective um, contributed by D. And so Rutgers in New Brunswick, we are the um, the AAU campus, the BTA campus of the state system, uh, although there are other campuses of Rutgers across New Jersey. Um, we're an R1 research university, and we've had that need to develop more advanced um, research support uh, from the libraries. So this proposal for the pilot um, actually hit many of the themes. Uh, we recently went through a strategic planning process and our theme, four themes and three goals are illustrated on this slide. But you will see that this graduate specialist program uh, supports research, strengthens um, faculty and graduate student research and teaching, empowers student success, builds connections, and also has this physical space aspect, uh, physical and virtual space aspect that's benefited us. So it actually really hits all of these themes. Um, going back to what we were thinking when we set up the pilot in 2018, um, you know, this audience knows data librarianship and knows data services. Uh, so you'll know that there are many institutions that have uh, more full featured, a more full featured suite of data services that a, a big piece of it is having full-time staff available. Uh, to support that. At Rutgers, we just have a couple of librarians, really, um, and 
our other other librarians have actually been drawn into this program and started to participate as mentors. Uh, but the core started with just me and Francesca. Um, and we, we haven't had that ability to tap into other uh, people, other human resources to to expand what we do. So we said, let's go after the graduate student population. We are a big research university. We've got talented graduate students. Uh, they're out there. We believe they're out there. We can entice them to work for the libraries if we give them a good opportunity and we pay them a higher wage than we normally would. Our, our normal rate is $15 an hour for um, pretty much all other library assistants, uh, student, student workers um, in the libraries. And we said we have to have a higher um, rate for this. We're, we're trying to attract people with advanced skills. We want, we want senior PhD students who are you know, going to come in ready to go with a lot of skills. And we, we made that argument. Um, and we, so far, 25 has, has been enough. It, it's a world where that may not be enough for forever, but um, that was a key component. Um, so our initial position descriptions are on this slide. Um, you can peruse those, but um, we wanted to bring those skills in to the libraries uh, but also give the students an opportunity to develop their teaching, uh, develop a, a portfolio of things that they can then point to and say, you know, I, I am a good instructor and I can teach people about these technology tools and give them a, a chance to explore new things as well. Um, so in 2018, we just hired two students, um, one reporting to me, one reporting to Francesca. Uh, we tried to hire a third. We actually did hire her, but she had to depart Rutgers due to a family emergency. That was the curveball that was thrown us in spring 2018. That person was going to support qualitative data. Uh, small scale, but we were getting used to our spaces. We, we were teaching in our existing digital humanities lab and standard library classrooms. We created LibGuides and a GitHub repository to support our instructional materials, which initially were um, small, but they have expanded over time. This is a snapshot of an earlier view of our uh, graduate specialist LibGuide page. Uh, LibGuides, if you're not familiar with that, uh, is a popular in American academic libraries, at least, uh, system for just constructing web pages and with a research guide type of format by default. Uh, this is our GitHub site as it is now, um, and we, for anything that's coding related, we're now really trying to encourage the students to um, work with this format by default so that we can just push things easily into the repository. We have one place where materials go. Uh, in 2018, we had 50 Python people and 29 DH people come and register for workshops on these various topics. Uh, that we were offering. And we had really two great students starting out the program who who seemed to intuit exactly what we wanted to do. Um, very clear introductory materials um, that were not too simple either. Um, and the feedback that we collected from workshop participants showed that they were almost all extremely satisfied. Um, not just very satisfied, but extremely satisfied. and. Um, they they had a lot of, of nice comments, so we we felt uh, validated by that, that that this pilot could continue. Um, it was, however, the workshops that were people were interested in. They liked those. They wanted more. They wanted new topics. Uh, we offered consulting hours, but it was very hard for people to find out about them independently. If they'd come to a workshop, then they knew the instructor, they might come back and ask for help. But the location of our DH lab is kind of, it's on the top level of the library, kind of in the back. Um, we don't have a system where we can easily push information out to people. Um, so that has been a challenge throughout. However, we did in academic year 2019, move to expand to four specialists. So we brought back the qualitative person. We 
or, or a qualitative person, we added an open science position as a kind of experiment in a different direction. Um, and we saw an increase in our registrations, just comparable numbers for spring, the, the next year's spring. And our curveball, I, I would say, during that year was learning more about work rules for international student eligibility. Um, we, of course, hire students authorized to work for us, but there were hours rules that that took us by surprise because we didn't know all the details that even if a student wasn't actually working a certain number of hours as a, for example a TA a TA commitment had a certain default number of hours that goes along with it so we were bumping up against these limits made it hard to schedule our students who had multiple commitments and made us more careful in future hiring to um, uh, question them and insist on um, them being able to commit consistently to a, a certain number of hours. We actually target 10 hours a week with some flexibility. Um, we were perhaps too flexible in the beginning. Now we say, you know, it really needs to be between 8 and 12 hours a week um, because if we don't stick to that, we end up in, uh, in trouble one way or the other. Okay, so in academic year 2020, um, we th this is fall 19 and spring 2020, we reconfigured. There was still the largest demand for Python, so we, we dropped the open science and we just went with two quantitative data specialists. We added a GIS specialist to support something that we had not really done anything with before. We were able to add new topics on things like cryptocurrency or QGIS or Palladio and Tableau. Uh, and we were still on a kind of upward trend uh, with our number of workshop registrants. Um, however, that those numbers are reflective of COVID coming in in the middle of spring 20, 2020 and throwing a big wrench in everything. So I had mentioned, uh, before we get to that, here's this was our 2020 cohort, just to give you an idea of the fantastic student group that we have had working with us. And... These are, we, we always need a word cloud, right? So um, topics from the spring 2020 series, just to give you a sense. And the departments attending the Python workshops, this is just Python for this, this slide um, in 2020. So you can actually see that what we found is we've had a very um, wide range of units disciplinary interests come to different things uh, the Python tilts more to the sciences obviously than digital humanities but within those broad parameters there is um, a, a really a big range you know we, we, we can't say that we're targeting any one specific area we are reaching a wide uh, spectrum of the university so that is actually really nice uh, feedbacks from last year along the way is you know people were asking they were appreciating uh, and encouraging us to continue focusing on patient detailed and clear instruction um, suggesting even more topics including things that we wouldn't get into like red cap which is health sciences which there is a separate school for the health sciences at rutgers that we um but other, other topics are always uh, things we might explore in the future. Uh, and people were asking for snacks, right? And that sounds funny uh, in the COVID world, but this, some of these comments are pre-COVID. Um, the pace and depth of content has always been an issue. Some people will find it too fast. Some people will find it too slow. And we have encouraged our students to include things for all levels in their workshops. These are open, they're walk-in workshops. You, we can't really screen effectively for, you must know this to come in. Um, so it's always gonna be an element of that. And we just recognize that that's an issue and we try to, to deal with that as best we can. We have increased the number of the sort of separation of, we, we have workshops labeled for beginners, we have workshops labeled as advanced. Uh, and we try to deal with some of it that way. 
Okay, so the title of this, this presentation is From Pilot to Jetstream. Now we're getting to the Jetstream part. Um, the, the employment of the student workers you know, was, was one piece of this puzzle uh, where we're, we're simply trying to deliver more effective instruction, more effective um, workshops to our students. And on these data science topics, you know, we, we all know that interactive small group learning is so much more effective. So up until the um, spring of 2020, our classroom space has all been very sort of traditional. That, well, the DH lab is nice, but it's very small. It can really only accommodate eight or 10 people. Um, the, and then we have traditional classroom space with banks of computers lined up in rows. Um, connected with the development of this program, we also got support from our director to renovate a room for collaborative learning. So the Jetstream is our, uh, and that has an acronym um, that has words like transdisciplinary and research and things under underlying it, but it, it's so that it comes out to be Jetstream. Um, as a space for people to meet, for, for instruction to be held, for groups to meet and have discussion in a very flexible environment. So everything in this room is on wheels. It can be reconfigured uh, trapezoidal tables that can be maneuvered into different shapes. This little pyramid is a mobile uh, laptop uh, power station. Uh, we have mobile whiteboards. We have, it, you don't see them in this in these photos because this was, was taken before the monitors arrived, but big screen monitors to display things. And everything is done via laptop. So you bring your laptop in, connect wirelessly to the monitor. Students can do that as well. Um, and anyone can throw something up on the screen and start a discussion. This um, space is reserved for collaborative, innovative learning opportunities, or that was the intention. Uh, we only got to use this for a few weeks and had just a handful of events in there before COVID came and, and got us in um, spring of 2020. We'd like to go back to that and build this, uh, build this space as a really vibrant hub for that kind of collaborative work. Uh, so we all know what COVID had done to us. We pretty quickly shut down physically, uh, but because we had this cohort of talented graduate students, we, we were able to move online in a way that other uh, parts of the library just couldn't. Um, our workshop were the vast majority of them able to be offered online. Uh, many entire series uh, saw no interruption. Um, and we, we had been asked for webinars for a long time. Uh, and we finally succeeded with that. So we, we uh, had a all of us had a crash course uh, as the world did in, in Zoom and WebEx presentations. Um, and it worked. You know, it was actually really um, uh, a, a positive experience in the end, um, COVID notwithstanding. Um, and so that prepared us for this academic year when everything has been online. And this academic year, we um, placed a great emphasis on making recordings available of our material. Uh, the vast majority of it is available. Uh, we, we don't take a prescriptive approach to the, you know, the st students. Uh, some of them are not comfortable being completely sort of exposed online in a, like a public. Um, I don't mind having my YouTube videos up, but that's not something that a PhD student going on the job market is necessarily comfortable with, and we're not going to force them down that route. Um, but everyone has done something to make materials available online, whether that's the code or documents or instructions or recordings. Uh, we work with the students to um, do something that's comfortable for them. And we're happy to make recordings available for a period of time and then take them down as well. Um, so you can see by the numbers here that we had this effect, right, where we got out in front of people. Uh, people were in the fall were 
looking for online opportunities, knowing that we're in the COVID world. Um, and our workshop series were one of the few things that was all online from the libraries. So we saw an explosion in registrant numbers. Um, 566 people registered for the various Python things in the fall. Um, we had a new series called Data Science Basics that was the sort of beginner's track uh, separated out from some of the more advanced Python with 282. Uh, now that's dropped off back to more normal numbers, but still growing numbers uh, in the spring. Um, that may be Zoom fatigue, that may be people have realized they've committed to all these online things that they, they need to tone it down a bit. Um, anyway, so we did weather that sort of uh, fall period where we had to limit the capacity on the workshops. Um, it was the first time we really had to cap numbers of registrants. Um, and I, I should also mention that the actual number of attendees is, is typically about half of the number that register, uh, but the registration numbers are more consistently and automated in their collection. So I'm quoting those numbers. Um, the number of actual attendees requires the the student to, to pay close attention to something else while they're, they're delivering their talk and monitor the participant list and we don't always um, get that number as precise uh, but it, it is usually about 50 percent it doesn't vary uh, I'm comfortable using the registration numbers because I don't think there's a significant variation like one series has a lot of no shows and another is everyone showing up um, Anyway, that's an aside that I should cut short. So also during this academic year, three of our data specialists left at the end of the fall semester uh, because they got early job offers. Now this was good news for them, it's good news for us in terms of we're developing uh, their skills in a way that pays off for them. Uh, so they're now working at Red Hat, at Citibank, at The Gap, um, in data analytics at The Gap, not just uh, in the store at the mall. Um, and uh, I've got a quote here from one of our students uh, that they have found that our, our intention was to make it a valuable experience and that is reflected in what they're telling us as well. So we hired people in spring 2021 uh, purely online, uh, have never met them in person, um, supervising them online uh, which has been a new experience, but again, fortunately, we have very mature and disciplined uh, graduate students who are able to handle that kind of new world that we live in. All right, now I want to uh, move to the concluding phase by talking about collaborations that have developed out of this. Uh, so one uh, straightforward collaboration is we often get requests to repeat workshop content for specific audiences. You know, people will say that that Python workshop was great, but we want you to come and talk to the psychology department about it. Um, and we've been happy to accommodate those and coach our students to um, accommodate that and do, do those uh, special teaching opportunities. And I think that's an indicator of our relevance. Um, we have built a much stronger collaboration with our Office of Advanced Research Computing through this program. Um, they have people coming to them. They offer training in using the High Performance Computing Cluster. That's Amarel at Rutgers. And their training is focused on the technicalities of connecting, submitting jobs, and things like that. And they get people who are looking for help with Python and R and, and things like that. So they, they have started sending people to our workshops and cross-listing them and saying, hey, look, the libraries have this stuff. We have been s letting people know about the OARC services and say, hey, you know, if you're interested in this, you, we have this fantastic resource that's free to Rutgers students. Uh, you can just jump on the HPC cluster and get up to speed with their uh, workshops. As part of that, we, we decided that we were going to develop a kind of special workshop series that is machine learning with Amarel. So I did some for R. Our Python 
specialists did it for Python, where we're, we're taking our traditional approach of, okay, here's how you use Python for data analysis, but we're doing it in the context of working on the cluster with some big data type examples. Uh, and that was a very um, interesting uh, learning process uh, and built our capacity and built our ability to collaborate. So now we think of each other as, as partners in this kind of work, which was not the case before this program. Another collaboration is the Erdos Institute. Uh, this is a, a program that is designed to train PhD students in data science skills, um, to give them skills that will help them succeed in the non-academic job market is one of the goals. Uh, and one of their major initiatives is a, is a data boot camp that they run for PhD students. This started at Ohio State. They wanted to do an in-person workshop at Rutgers. They, they came to the libraries uh, because of our jet stream, right? They, they were interested in using that space. That was the, the starting point. Uh, of course, physical plans got canceled by COVID and they decided to make it a nationwide virtual event, which because we had our talented graduate specialists available, we could say, yes, we, we will support that. We'll, our, our graduate st students were happy to participate because it's a learning experience for them. Um, I tagged along last year as well as a TA and learned a lot about machine learning in Python. Um, there were 129 students last year, of which more than 20 were from Rutgers. Um, this year, there's more than 300, and it's going on right now. So our graduate specialists are working with that program this week as we speak. Um, last year, the Rutgers students, a Rutgers student group won the prize for the best project. They do a capstone project. Uh, we'll see what happens this year. This is um, just a screenshot from their uh, Erdos page. Uh, another benefit of this program is because we were offering so many workshops, we were ha getting into this issue of managing the information about the workshops became a, a spaghetti mess uh, with many different tools, many forms, uh, many places to post information. Um, and that pushed us to start making use of something that we actually had at access to in the libraries, which is the LibCal platform from SpringShare. That is a calendaring platform. Um, and here's the one exception to not clicking over to the web. Uh, just to show you that what that interface looks like if you're not familiar with it, um, provided a clean one-stop place for us to input information and students to discover information about workshops, um, which can also manage all the registration. So this is past time, but uh, for upcoming workshops, there would be a registration button. Um, the email lists of attendees are then available. You can push automated feedback forms to them, automated reminders, push the Zoom links to them. Um, and it has simplified that so much. And I think also given uh, part of the reason for those high, high numbers, I think this year has been, this is much easier to use than what we, what we had. And we were able to tag the workshops by, by topic. Um, and this, this has also been a fulfillment of a longstanding desire to make our workshop information better. We can also cross list things like the advanced research computing workshops on the LibCal. Uh, and our final uh, new thing here, the final benefit of our program, uh, this academic year, two other new initiatives began uh, using the model of the graduate specialist, using the model of we're hiring advanced graduate students, we have librarians to mentor and supervise them, and we're, we're enabling this advanced use. One of them is called the IDEA program. That is a program that uh, is a design thinking experience for incoming freshmen. They come in, they spend a year in, a, in small groups doing learning about design thinking, learning about innovation in that context, and doing projects. But we have graduate student mentors 
who are also interested in that stuff and are side by side working with the students throughout the academic year. A second one is an intensive literature review program where we've hired graduate students and in this case these are traditional library and information science students that we've hired uh, to assist faculty in sort of special short-term research projects. They are not full-time research assistants to the faculty but they will do literature searches for the faculty under specific guidelines. We think that that is a, a, a skill set that ties in well with the LAS students um, and this is brand new. This just started this semester. The, the most important fact I think maybe about these two programs is the libraries don't pay the students salaries. The programs, the, the external schools are paying the students salaries. We are contributing our labor and expertise to mentor and supervise the students, which is not insignificant. Um, but we, we again have identified librarians who are inter interested in these topics. Um, it seems to be a win-win for everybody. Um, and it is the f one of the first times that the libraries at Rutgers have gotten this, this kind of external support and external inflow of cash. Say, hey, we'll, we'll pay, this looks interesting. We'll pay people to do that. Um, and you take care of it for us. So we, we're, I think we're showing value in a very different way through this program. Uh, so a summary of our impact. Uh, lots of students educated, 14 graduate specialists hired and trained through this program and hopefully moving on to um, improved futures. Uh, and all of those benefits of um, physical and virtual space being built up, an archive of online material being built up, and collaboration being built up across the university. I think we've seen that. Um, I'll save the other considerations for discussion. Um, you know, we need to think about sustainable programs. We need to think about adapting our topics and offerings constantly as time goes on. Um, that changes. I'll save that for discussion. And I'll also save discussion of our future for um, the live discussion. Or if you're not able to attend the live discussion, please feel free to reach out to me by email or have some other contact information on my website. <clears throat> and um, happy to talk about any of these topics or really any data science topics, uh, especially with IS sisters. So thank you for your attention. Spasiba, mashik pajtla, whatever language you prefer to express your, your thanks in. Um, I appreciate your listening uh, and I appreciate being part of the best virtual IS ever.